Well, we have a number of passages to look at this morning, so I'm going to start and we're going to begin with uh, chapter 17 in 1 Samuel, and we're going to look at um, verses 41 through 58. So again, turn to 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 41. Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines, and I will give, the, or, and I will give them to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead and the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the slain Philistines lay along the way to Shearim, even to Gath and Ekron. And the sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistine and plundered their camps. Then David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his weapon in his tent. Now when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? And Abner said, by your life, O king, I do not know. And the king said, you inquire whose son the youth is. So when David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the Philistine's head in his hand. And David said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now we're going to turn over to... Revelation, so turn to Revelation 19, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 16. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war, and his eyes are a flame of fire and upon his head are many diadems, and he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. And he is clothed with a robe tipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in white linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now our third passage is from Psalm 118. That's Psalm 118, and we're going to look at verses 25 and 26. Psalm 18, or 118, I'm sorry verses 25 and 26. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Finally, the Gospel of Mark. We're going to look at Mark 
chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 11. Beginning in verse 8, chapter 11 of Mark. And many spread their garments on the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed after were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking all around, he departed for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. Mike? Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. I am shocked. I thought there would be maybe one, two, three. I was asked one time 20 years ago, would you teach my Sunday school class? So I drove close to 50 miles uh, one way and 50 miles back. There were two girls in the back corner and they were talking to one another. But um, I'm so grateful you're here this morning. You all are spirited warriors, what can I say? And uh, perfect for this, the 11th lesson in the rise of David, a king without a kingdom. We are back in the for the last time in the Valley of Elah, the armies are lined up opposite of one another. Goliath, this immense Philistine warrior, the literal translation of champion, is the man in the middle. And that's what he was. He was between the two armies. He had been coming out twice a day to shout the challenge to the camp of Israel without a response. But now... This day is different. A young man comes forward to face the Philistine. The immediate context we notice has three contrasts that are important for our study this morning. First is the inspired language as it comes to us in verses 41 through 44. We have the same repetitive narrative in the inspired language used with the same person which slows down the pace emphasizing Goliath's lumbering movements the text reads and the Philistine and the Philistine and the Philistine 42 43 44 whereas David is described in terms that are agile quick nimble Verse 40, look at those verbs, took, chose, put, approached. The second contrast, the combatants themselves, verses 44 and 45. This is the war cry of both the combatants. And that, were, that war cry of David unravels into some very significant theology. Therefore, we read this morning, thank you, Warren, for that war cry across the pages of Scripture. We will address that. The contrast can be summarized with this phrase, you but I. Goliath comes, verse 44, come to me, he says, and David responds, Verse 45, I come to you. The third contrast, the Philistine giant is the representative of the best and the greatest of the pagan world in both height, verse 4, and his weaponry, verses 5, 6, and 7. All the while, David comes himself in the appearance of a shepherd without any formidable equipment and with the stature of only a youth. But it is actually in verse 45 that the contrast ends and David rivets our attention with his dialogue. 
new features here in the revelation of God's Word. For now, for the first time, David is going to speak as the Lord's King upon the earth. Let's remember, Saul was a fraud, a fake, the epitome of the people's choice, just like all the other nations. A king like the nations. 1 Samuel 15, he builds a monument to himself. And the Lord tells Samuel in that very chapter, I regret that I have made Saul king. He has turned his back from following me. David now comes to the battlefield, and here's an important word, asserts. He asserts with what is going on at the moment. Very important to think about. He comes as God's vice regent. What does that mean? That means that to war against David is to war against God Himself. David is a type. David is a shadow of the substance to come. His Son will be the greatest. The end of His line. But on this day, this day, David, as a warrior, comes to establish the Lord's name and His kingdom in the earth. In the earth. You will hear me reference in the earth time and time again because that is where the Lord's kingdom is going to be at the end of history. In the earth. And He's come to establish it right here as the Lord's King. All the nations that oppose Him from this time forward and the regime of Saul that opposes Him will fall and fail. He is a shadow. He is like the One to come. The Lord Jesus. The Son of David, who at the end of history will come and He will assert. There's that word. He will come and assert Himself with whatever is going on at the time. And He will take the reins of history and conquer and establish His kingdom. And that is Revelation 19, verses 11-16. through I saw heaven open, behold a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like flames of fire, and on his head were crowns. And he had a name written that no one knows except himself. He was clothed with a robe, dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow Him on white horses. And now out of His mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it He will strike the nations. The nations, my friend. The nations of the earth. And He Himself will rule them with a rod of iron, and He Himself will tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And He has on His robe and on His thigh a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. That is a day to come. But on this day where we are studying 1 Samuel 17, this warfare is the precursor to all of that. It is the shadow of all of that, if you will. David fights as a unique man. Just like his son, who also comes, the Lord Jesus, the unique man. There has never been one like him in all history. No one has ever had 
are been defined with a heart one and the same as the living God. He is the least of Jesse's sons. He was identified by the Lord Himself to the prophet Samuel. And He was anointed. And that anointing is confirmed by the Spirit of God that rushed upon Him. Think of His language. The unique man. No one in the history of the Scriptures has ever come in the name of the Lord. That phrase alone carries an interesting progress through God's Word. Let's take a few moments and examine it. It is edifying for us. Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. Verse 25, a petition for prosperity with a repetition for it to be done immediately. I pray, now the covenant name, the voice of the burning bush, Lord, save now. Send prosperity now, Lord. And verse 26, blessed he is He who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless You from the house of the Lord. There it is, four times. The covenant name. The ancient believer calling upon the living God to remind Him through a petition of David's war cry in 1 Samuel 17. Out of the mouth of the king came this phrase. Now, what's relevant about that? Well, what's relevant is that that war cry under the Spirit's direction in Psalm 118, it's made for us commoners as well. Not just royalty or a king, but to, to and for all of us to use. Seeking His intervention and His power immediately by repetition. The word now used twice. So that we ourselves become the overcomers like David. And finally, we recognize and actually see the fulfillment of David's war cry when our Lord comes in to the city of David with the triumphal entry and the people Shout it out at Him. It's in all four Gospels. In Matthew and Mark, specifically making reference to David. Many people spread their cloaks on the road. And others spread leafy branches which they cut down from fields. And they went before and they followed, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is the One who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is His coming kingdom from our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He came as a conquering king with the war cry, of David from 1 Samuel 17. So there it is. The three phrases in the Scriptures. 1 Samuel 17. The intermediary Psalm 118. And the fulfillment in all four Gospels with Christ's triumph in, and uh, entry. Now what do we make of this? <laughs> I studied and studied and thought and thought. I read everything that I could trying to put the three separate contexts together and link them into some message that is relevant. And suddenly, there it was, at least to me, 
1 Samuel 17, the king comes in power to defeat the great warrior of the world. To do what? To establish the Lord's name and His kingdom. Which, like His Son, will have a long pause before the establishment of that kingdom. In Psalm 118, a prayer for power and prosperity, using David's own words. What is the prayer? It comes from the commoners, the loyal subjects to his kingdom, you and me. Keep the king's kingdom advancing. That's the prayer of the common people. Advancing our loyal subjects to Him. Representatives to and for Him. Think about this. He must answer our prayers. He is obligated to answer our prayers. Because as we pray to Him, He answers because it perpetuates His name and His kingdom in the earth. That's why the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Therefore we come boldly, boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. Think of our time of need. Psalm 118, verse 5. The people are in distress. In verse 10, they're surrounded by enemies and they are in weakness. And then the battle cry of David comes forth. And there it is. The three phrases. All from 1 Samuel 17. Now, 1 Samuel 17 and verse 46. This warrior cry, I want you to see, is prophetic and it is decisive. Look what he says. This day, not tomorrow, not next week or month, this day, and I count three wills addressing the enemy, prophetically speaking, of his destruction. The destruction of the wicked. This is not the bravado of a warrior. This is the vice regent of the Lord. He is coming to establish the Lord's kingdom. And prophetically, he speaks about the certainty that he will conquer and achieve. Here's the purpose. To know, mentioned twice. Look, verse 46, for the earth to know. And for those assembled here, verse 47, to know. What is it to know? It's the echo of the Exodus and God's victory over the Pharaoh and all of Egypt. Exodus 9 16, and used and quoted by the Apostle Paul most skillfully in Romans chapter 9 and verse 17, God's sovereign purpose that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. There it is. The three wills. I will, I will, I will. Thus, teaching you and me Trust God. Fear not your powerful foes. God controls the future. Now, verse 48. My friends, we have gone 47 verses to finally arrive here. The battle itself. We have listened ad nauseum to the superiority 
of the Philistine warrior. His equipment, his strength, his height, ad nauseum. God's deliverance comes in his own way. Not with a sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Overruling the resistance of his brother Eliab. Overruling the resistance of Saul. And now overruling the giant himself. It is the Lord's battle, my friends. Not a holy war. Not even a just hostility. It is an encounter that establishes his name and his superiority in all of the earth. No matter how the combatants fare in time and space. Consider, just as worthy as the champion King David that day, are other champions and noted for all eternity. The writer to the epistle to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11. Others suffered mockings and floggings, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. All heroes. The Lord's battle is about His name and His superiority and it being established in the earth. That's really the theology of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel chapter 3. Remember? Their voices. If we're thrown into this blazing furnace, the God who we serve is able to deliver us from it. And He will deliver us from it, Your Majesty and Your Majesty's hand. But even if he does not, does not, we want your majesty to know that we will not, not serve your gods or worship the image that you have set up. Again, the battle cry of Esther in Esther chapter 4, saying to her uncle Mordecai, I'll go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. And so the battle of the Lord continues on from the Scriptures on through history with reminders like a pious reformer, a Roman Catholic priest, who got saved by grace in England. He brings to his congregation a new message. William Sautre, a hallowed name. William Sautre. He presumed to say to his audience, instead of adoring the cross, on which Christ suffered, I adore the Christ who suffered on that cross. And for that, he was dragged from St. Paul's, his hair shaved off in humiliation, a layman's cap placed upon his head, showing everyone he has been demoted. He was discharged to the Earl Marshal of England, and he was burnt alive at Smithfield in England. In the beginning of March, March, 
1401. Sartre was the first martyr of the Reformation in England. My friends, the battle is the Lord's. Here it is. The action is over as in a moment. Verse 49. Took a stone, slung, struck, sank. The Philistine falls face down. In verse 51, David ran, took his sword, cut off his head with it. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, the God who Goliath served was found face down with a severed head before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, that idol's warrior is face down and headless. The Lord is the warrior of the battle. The Philistine military, seeing their hero dead, like all the cowards of the world, depending on the arm of the flesh, flee in panic. With the Israelites' forces in hot pursuit, they plunder their camp. Verse 55, all the while, all the while, Saul just watched. His laziness and failure only setting a platform for the final exaltation, verse 58, of Jesse of Bethlehem, now known as a great father in all of Israel. Proverbs 12.31 the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. You and I, every day, we prepare ourselves by trusting Him for our day. Then if providence calls, we let Him fight it. For our part, for our part, let's be like David here. Let's run. Run at your enemies. Run at those who would be hostile forces against you. For they would be defying God's plan and purpose for you and for your life. Run at them. The battle, my friends, is the Lord's. And your testimony is for all eternity. You're playing a much bigger game than they ever considered. Your voice, your commitment will be known by everyone for eons. We've been through these 55 verses Let's learn something. We're here in 1 Samuel 17 all because of one thing. One thing. Sloth. Indolence. Procrastination. The Philistines should never have been there in the first place. Much less this giant. The first king of Israel had no courage. Weak, timid, frightful, just like his warriors. Forty days of silence in the Word of God, a damning fact 
in God's history. Proverbs 28.1 The wicked flee, but no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. The lion runs. The lion of the tribe of Judah ran at his enemy. So did his son. Isaiah 50 verse 7. Because the sovereign Lord is my helper, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And I know I will not be put to shame. Put to death. Put to death. Suffered. But not be put to shame. Run at your enemies. Run at the intimidation that faces you. Go undaunted. On January the 11th, 1956, Pilate Nate Saint, Ed McCulley, Peter Fleming, Roger Udarian, and Jim Elliott They flew into the rainforest of Ecuador seeking to reach for Jesus Christ the Alca Indians known to be unfriendly and a good possibility even dangerous. Their flight was attempting to bring gifts to establish a relationship with them. They were speared to death in the river before they ever got into the tribe. We all know the story. But what you may not know is that before they loaded on the plane, on the tarmac that day, they sang a hymn. Who will be on the Lord's side? The hymn comes from Moses' words in Exodus 32 and verse 26, which reads, Moses stood at the entrance of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the Levites gathered around Moses. They sang, on the tarmac that day. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be His helpers? Others' lives to bring. Who will leave the world's side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for Him will go? By Thy call of mercy, by Thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side. Savior, we are Thine. They didn't make it. Their bodies floating in the river, potted with spear strikes, all badges of courage, loyalty for their king. They came to establish the Lord's name and His kingdom in the earth. And so, they didn't die in vain. They died great champions of eternity. And today, in the tick of this clock, they have no regrets. They are history's great winners. For the day and the time in the future, God's kingdom will come and be established on the earth. And they will rule and reign like All of us, champions, 
and warriors for the living God. Let's pray. Lord, you know our frame, that we are but dust. We falter and fail because we are like Saul and the warriors of Israel. We are weak and timid. We don't speak up. We just walk away. We don't assert ourselves as You would have us. For Your namesake and for Your kingdom, of which we are Your people, grant, Lord, strength, courage, boldness for each and every one of us to be faithful all the way to the very last breath. For Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.